Well, we all try our best, right? Well, you could probably get started with so the, the Go Workshop. How many of you are here for the Go Workshop? Cool. What the fuck is this? So, um, yeah, so this is the fourth workshop. We're just going to be continuing with the platform example. There's the slides on the Discord if you want to have those open, because I'm just going to kind of be doing this in Godot as we go. So today we're going to be covering prefabs and tile sets and animated sprites and cameras and maybe more if we have time. But that's what I have planned. So we're going to start off with a note on prefabs. We kind of started doing this in workshop two but we didn't have time for that, so we're going to go over them now. So if we look at our player in our scene, um, if you have your scene open, that's fine, or you can just look at the screen. That's also OK. We have our player as just you know a node in our scene, and it's got a script attached to it, and it's got a sprite, and it's collision shape, and so on. And it's got some script variables that we can modify, and that'll change things. But if we wanted to move it to another scene, say we wanted to you know, dynamically spawn this player in another scene, or we have lots of scenes that we want to spawn our player in, we would have to kind of remake this whole player. We would have to make a new rigid body object and attach a script to it, set the variables, add a sprite, add a collision shape, so on and so forth. That's a lot of work, and it's really dumb. So. It would be nice if we had prefabs, which are kind of a Unity or um, other game engine kind of concept. Um, it would be nice if we had them. But Godot doesn't actually have prefabs, necessarily. Um, you can get prefab functionality out of the scene system. So Basically, you, the, the whole point of the scene system and this node hierarchy and everything is that you can spawn prefabs or spawn scenes inside of scenes, which is basically how you get prefab functionality. So if we wanted to make this you know, branch, which is just this player, its sprite, and its collision shape into a scene, then we can just right click on it and say, save branch as scene, and then we have our prefabs folder, and we can just save it as our player. So now if we go into our prefabs player, open it as another scene, we can see that it is just, you know, its own scene. It's got a root node and everything, and we can reposition this to zero, zero which is something you probably want to do, because if you spawn this into another scene, then it's going to spawn where the player's position is in this scene. So that should probably be 0, 0, because then you can reposition it in the other scene. And we can save that. And we can see that now we have our player. We can't access any of its children, but we don't really need to. We can just have the player. We can reposition it wherever we want, and it's fine. So now if we wanted to have a new scene, so no 2D or something, then we can just drag the player in, and the player is in just like the other scene. It would work just as well. I'm not going to say this scene. Uh, but that's kind of how you do the prefab functionality in Godot without really using prefabs. I like to logically separate my prefabs and my actual scenes. There's no technical differentiation between a scene and a prefab on you know the technical level, but I like to logically separate them because there are differences. Scenes typically have you know just node types as the root, and you have a bunch of other objects in them. And prefabs are just a single concentrated object that you want to treat as an object. So I have a prefabs folder and a scenes folder. But you could interchange those pretty easily, and there's no real difference between them. So, yeah, 
that. Uh, so yeah, does anyone have any questions on prefab functionality in Bigdub? If you want to quickly access the scene that a prefab is attached to, um, or located in, you can just hit this scene button, open an editor, and it'll open it in a new tab, and you can edit all the differences. You can also view a um, object's children. You can't really do a lot of meaningful changes to them unless you break the prefab instance, but you can view them, and then you can like get the node path to them, and so on. And that's with this editable children check mark. So now we're going to start doing tile sets. And we have this tile set um, asset right here. It's this atlas. You can see that there's a bunch of tiles in there. And we want to be able to use those uh, or be able to you know, paint through our scene with them. So just like in Unity, Godot has this tile set system. And you lay out this, these tile sets by um, specifying areas within a tile sheet or an atlas, uh, which is this. It's just one big texture that we can specify uh, individual textures inside of. And that's sometimes called an atlas. Sometimes it's called a region of a texture. Um, but you know, same terminology. So your tiles don't necessarily need to be the same size or shape. Uh, it would, it kind of makes it easier to work with if they are, but there's nothing stopping you from having a tile set with a bunch of different resolutions of tiles. Um, so the actual tile set workflow in 3.0 is very unintuitive. Um, 3.1 is very close. It's like 95% complete, so soon. But for now, we have to deal with 3.0. It's not that bad, it's just not very intuitive. So to actually start making our um, tile set, we need to have a new scene, start with a new scene, and just you know have a node 2D as our root. Then we want to add the actual tiles as sprites individually. So if we add sprite, and we load the assets, atlas.png, then we have this big atlas, uh, and we're kind of interested in all of these tiles up here. So what you do from here is because we want to actually individually address all of our um, tiles, is we need to specify a region. And in this um, inspector, you can do the region and enable the region. Sprite's going to disappear, but in the bottom uh, kind of tab, there's a texture region tab that you can, can expand. And this is where you're actually going to specify like which tiles are which. And in this little editor, you, can, you need to specify a snap mode. You can do pixel snap, which is going to basically snap to pixels as you um, drag something. So you can kind of modify this pixel by pixel. I recommend doing grid snap because you can specify the actual tile size that you want. I'm going to do 32 by 32, because I know this, these are 32 by 32 tiles. And so now, when we select, it's going to do it in groups of 32. So for our first texture, or our first sprite, I'm just going to select this right here. So if we go back here, then we can see that this is our tile that we've selected. and that's just you know our first tile. So we can duplicate this, uh, have it sprite two. I'm going to name this you know grass one, and then when we duplicate it, it's going to become grass two. And then you just need to specify a new tile. If we move this, then we can see that these two tiles are independent. You don't necessarily need to move them away from each other. Um, so if you, if you just want to quickly specify um, new tiles, you can just keep duplicating and, and keep selecting new tiles. So that's a tile, that's a tile, that's a tile. Well, that's not a tile anymore. But yeah, so we have all of these different
tiles that we have, uh, and these are going to be the tiles that we can use to paint. So you want to save this as a scene. Um, it can be in scenes, it can be in prefabs, it can be in a bunch of places. I'm going to put it in prefabs. You can decide where, you, where this actually goes, but this is our tile set. TSC. So this isn't actually a tile set yet. This is just a regular scene with a bunch of sprites in it. But what we need to do to actually make it a tile set is to go into scenes, convert to tile set. And that's the very unintuitive part, is that you have to convert this scene filled with sprites into a tile set resource. This is much improved in 3.1. There's a whole tile set editor and it's great. Uh, you can do auto tiling, it's really cool, but for now this is what we have. So this tile set, um, I'm going to put it into the resources folder. I'm just going to make a new folder. You can put this in prefabs probably, because it's kind of a prefab, but I'm going to put it in resources. I'm going to say this is our tile set dot tres. And you have to specify a um, extension on this because these, um, this can either be a text viewable resource or a binary resource, uh, tres being the text, res being the binary. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, um, but I typically use tres because it's easier to solve merge conflicts that way. But once you have that, you just save it, and we can see in our resources folder, there's a tileset.tres. So now that we have this tile set, we can actually start using it in our tile map, which is a node that you add to scenes. And so this is actually what's going to be like the layer that all of the tiles are on. And it has a parameter uh, called tile set, and you just load the tile set that you just made. So resources, tile set. And we can see on the left there, we have all of the tiles that we specified. Yeah. Um, you're also going to need to specify that you want this to be a 32 by 32 cell size. Um, otherwise, it's going to have you know blank uh, spaces and everything. So we can paint this however we want. So let's just like have oh that looks really bad. Delete that. So you just paint it just like any other real tile editor set editor or whatever. That's not quite cut correctly, but meh. Um, and then you can also play with these like flipping. So you can make upside down tiles, rotated tiles, or that's not quite rotated, rotated tiles and so on. And it's going to be fine. So now we don't need this static body anymore because we have a level to play with. And if we play, then we're going to fall right through the floor behind the tile map. So now we need to actually add some sort of collision to each of these tiles. Fortunately, that's really easy to do. So in our tile set, we just need to add static bodies to each of these tiles. And so this static body is going to be copied into the tile set, and it's going to be kind of added to every object that you make, which is a tile. So if we just add a static body, and the static body is going to be the thing that the player is going to be standing on, and then we give it a collision shape, 2D. It's a rectangle, 16 by 16. And it's hard to see with all of these viewable, but this is our collision shape. So you can just um, duplicate this into each of the other um, grass tiles. And be careful duplicating um, static bodies and basically any rigid body because the collision shape 
that you use is actually shared by every static body that you copy. So if I change the collision shape um, uh, of this specific body, it's going to change it for every body in every tile. So if you want unique um, shapes, then you can click Make Unique on that tile shape uh, or that collision shape, and it's going to break that, that reference. So now all of your graphs should have static bodies in them, and so you can just convert to tile set again. And every time you make changes to your um, tile set scene, you need to re-export it as a tile set resource. But now that we've done that, it should automatically update in any scenes that you have using that tile set. And if we go ahead and run the game, then we're going to collide with the ground. Hooray, we have a level. Well, kind of. Um, is anyone having trouble with this? You all good? Yeah. I wasn't able to make a scene at first, so I was like, wait a minute. Oh, OK. Um, so yeah, so basically, scenes are just, you know, create a new scene up there, make it node 2D. And yeah, so at that point, then you can add your um, uh, your tile map and everything. I'm guessing you also don't have a player. Uh, yeah, I do have. A player. Okay. So that's basically it for scenes. Um, anyone else? Having trouble with that? Or assets, I mean. So, all of that's kind of outlined in the um, slideshow. I'll include a link to the documentation on these tile sets. Probably when 3.1 comes out, I'm, all, I'm going to do a repeat workshop on this to introduce the 3.1 tile set editor because it's like super good uh, in comparison to what it has now. So yeah. But for now we have a way to build a level. We can just go ahead and paint stuff. So we can make this. Have the player jump over here. This looks really bad but you know, whatever. Just do that. and. That's like a really, really quick way to start building um, a level for your player. And my player is super floaty right now, but you know I haven't done any, any tweaking or anything like that. So yeah, that is basically it for tile sets. So we should probably start going through animations. So in our assets, we can see that we have a player animation. Well, we have several. We have the idle, we have the jump, and then we have the run. So we need a way to play all these animations on this sprite that we have representing our player. So there's actually two ways, which is kind of confusing to animate sprites in Godot. There's an actual node called animated sprite, and then there's having a regular sprite with a tile sheet, or with not a tile sheet, a sprite sheet, and using an animation player to play the animation. So the animated sprite is specifically for having sprite animations using separate images, which is what we have in this case. So we have all of these PNG files that represent the, the frames of our animation, and we want to string all of those together to make an animation. Otherwise, the regular sprite node, you can cut it up into vertical frames and horizontal frames, and you can iterate through all the frames that way. And then you can animate the frame iteration in an animation player, but that's 
not what we're going to be doing here because we don't have a sprite sheet. So we need to change our sprite on our player to be an animated sprite so that we can use this animated sprite functionality. So that's easy enough. You just change the type to animated sprite. And now this looks a, quite a bit different than the regular sprite. You just add a sprite frames into the sprite frames um, parameter, and then you can click into it, and you'll be in the sprite frames editor. So once you're in here, um, this is basically the space that you're going to be putting all of the different frames of your animation, which should be all separate images, into this um, area. So you can just shift click on all of the things. So these are all of our idle animations. So I'm just going to drag that in here. I'm going to rename the animation to idle. And that's the animation done, basically. If we go back into Sprite and we set the playing to true, then we can see that our little player has motion. And that's you know easy enough. So we can also add new animations here. So let's have a run animation with all of the run sprites. Select all of them, drag them in. Uh, the default frame rate is five frames per second. So you may want to change the um, speed on that. So this looks probably better at you know, 15 looks like he's you know, actually running at that frame rate. And then we also have a jump, which I'm not going to implement here because it'll take a little bit longer than the other two. But now we have a sprite with two different animations that each can play independently. So now we can start playing those animations from scripts. And you basically just need to get the sprite component or the sprite node from your player. And there's just a play method, and you specify the name of the animation. So we can go into script here. Um, and I'm going to make a new function for this, which is just change animation. First, I'm going to get a variable that holds the right that we have. So this syntax may look a bit weird. Um, this is just like you know any other variable declar declaration. We're having a sprite variable that we want to hold our sprite. But we have this on ready keyword before it. And so that basically means we want to declare it here, but we want to set its value in the ready function. And this is basically just shorthand for saying um, sprite equals sprite in ready. It's just easier to just have this on ready than to have a whole line dedicated to it. And this dollar sign sprite here is also a shorthand for get node sprite. And so this is going to get the node. The, uh, of the sprite child of the player. <coughs> um, and because it's just you know the immediate child of the player, there's a shorthand for that, which is just dollar sign sprite. And that'll return the sprite object that we have here, and we can do things with it. <coughs> so in our change animation, we probably have a animation change to. We want to say if the sprites animation, which is just the sprite dot animation, is not already equal to the animation, which is going to be a string, then we want to sprite dot play the animation. And so we can call this anywhere and we can call it every frame, and it's not going to keep restarting the animation where we want to play. So if we go into 
our check input, then we can see that we have these different um, sections where we're moving left, right, or not moving at all. And that's kind of perfect segmentation to start changing our animations. So here we want to change the animation to our idle, oh no, actually to our run, which is this run animation here. Uh, it has to match the name of the animation exactly, um, case sensitive and all. We also want this move right to be the run animation. Otherwise, we're going to have no motion at all, so we're going to change the animation to idle. And we also probably want to start with our animation to be idle, so we can just sprite play idle. I'm not going to do jump right now because it'll take quite a bit. But now we can go ahead and play. And so right now, it's kind of hard to see, but we have a little player that is moving there. And if we run, then we're going to run, well, backwards if we're going left, but forwards if we're going right. And so that's pretty easily remedied by one little parameter here, which is the flip horizontal and flip vertical. So we can set these to true to just you know flip the animation. And this is really useful for um, running left or running right. We don't have to specify a whole new animation. We just want to flip the direction. So we can make a new function for that too. So function change direction. Direction. So if the right dot flip h is not facing the correct direction, this is just going to be a Boolean value, so we can just do that. Um, then sprite flip h is the direction. So we can specify that we do want to flip, so change, or I name it, change direction, true, tour, <laughs> otherwise in the right we want to change direction to false, and if we go ahead and play again, then we now have left and right movement. Hooray! Kind of looks like a video game now. Um, does anyone have any questions on going through and doing that? Does this language support optional semicolons? Uh, let's see. I think so. Yes? Using true and false to say right versus left. So, so the actual value we're setting here is sprite.flip h, which is basically just saying, should we flip this animation? Mm. Um, and that's going to be a Boolean value. So basically, our default is going to be right when we're not flipped. So true, so false, not flipped, is going to be right. And then true, yes flipped, that's going to be left. Make like an enum to say right. Yes, and I was I was actually about to say we could probably make that a bit more clear by saying uh, enum uh, direction yeah I think we just do this so right left so this is by default going to be zero and one which is going to cast into true and false. So we can say the, that we want to change to direction dot right, right left. Or left, right or left. And we want to direction dot right. And 
here, we're going to probably want to cast this into a bool. Yeah. To do that, just because we don't want any weird undefined behavior. So if we play again, then it works great as well. And it's a little bit clearer as to why. So something else cool that we can do with this is we can specify the default direction of the player. So right now, um, we're just going to you know, not have age flipped. But if we wanted to, say, have a default direction, and set it to that, it's going to be, say, direction right. Then we can say change direction to the default direction. So this is, by default, just going to be the value that is represented by that enum. So it's going to be 0. But we can make that a lot better to look at by specifying the type that we want is the direction in export with these two parentheses. So this is going to be saying export of type direction, default direction, default is right. So now if we go back into the player, we can see that we have a drop down of left and right um, that we can specify for our direction. So if we set it to left, we play the video game, then I made a syntax error. What? that it's a integer anymore. Because yeah, that, that code is working. Um, we may need to cast it into an integer <laughs> from, from that and then cast it into a bool. <laughs> Should already be an integer, yeah. That's very interesting. That is a good idea. So the output was null. OK, that's why. <laughs> why is it null? should definitely not be null. B left. Oh, OK. It was getting confused, because I didn't actually set it in the editor. We're good. And I started off facing left. So yeah, you can do cool stuff with enums and setting them from the editor. And yeah. <laughs> Any other questions on doing animation stuff from animated sprite? There is like a whole other animation system with animation players, which is super cool. But um, it's easier for us to just make an animated sprite. With an animation player, you can actually animate literally any property of any node. So you could, you know, hypothetically animate the tile set and make it a completely different tile set during runtime with an animation, which is cool. But yeah. So something else we want to probably start looking into is a camera. So you can see that we have all this level over here, 
but our player can't really get over there. Well, they can, we just can't see them because they'll just run off the screen. So by default, Godot is basically going to say that everything between the coordinate 0, 0 to width height is going to be visible in the scene. That's the default viewport. And you know that makes sense um, on a technical level. But you probably want to change where the objects are visible at a scene. You want to you know, be following the player. And you want to be able to have a camera for that. And thankfully, there is a camera that you can use. And it's called camera. So if we just spawn this camera right here, we can see that there is a different tiny blue line that represents the view area of the camera. And I've added this as a child to the player because we want to, it to be following the player. So we want it to be inheriting the um, position of the player, which is gonna, what it's going to do. So this is our new viewport area defined by our camera. You need to make it current. I don't know why it's not current by default, but um, you can switch current um, cameras uh, you know, dynamically during the game. So the current one should be the one that you want to be using. And that's just, you know, click the check mark. So there are two modes for 2D cameras. The default one is drag center. The other one is fixed top left, in which the, the origin of the camera is going to be in the top left. Um, but in this drag center, we see it's going to be in the center. And if we go and look at the drag margin, we can see that there's this little area inside of the camera. So that area basically defines where the, where the parent can move around and the camera is going to stay still. So if we just go ahead and play this, then if we move around like normal, there's not going to be much camera movement. But if we start going to the right, it's going to start dragging the camera along uh, with it. Yep. And this is you know fine behavior for basically any basic platformer. Uh, you can define how those drag margins are defined. So we can make it you know less in that direction more in the bottom direction, uh, and so on. And it'll change all of those. The drag center is probably better if you want finer control over exactly where the camera's going to be. So if you're like, you know, interpolating it towards a position with an offset, that's going to be something you want to be doing with a fixed top left camera. But for now, this is fine, and it'll follow our player, and all is good. Um, there was something else that I was going to talk about. Does anyone have any questions first? How do you look at the drag line? Like so that's uh, down in the uh, editor section of the camera 2D. Mm -hmm. So you just click uh, draw drag margins, um, and that's going to have that player thing in center. There's also draw limits which you can't actually see because they're so far out, but um, there's basically limits to what the camera's gonna be rendering that you can specify. You can also draw the screen uh, itself if you don't want to see it, and so on. Um, so something else we probably want to pay attention to in our platformer is that we can jump um, forever. We can just, you know, go up. Um, and that's a problem because we don't want that. So we need a way to check and make sure that we are touching the ground and that we're good. As a rigid body 2D, there isn't really a nice function to use um, to know that we're on the ground. If we were using a kinematic body, there is something called um, is on floor, 
which works less than half the time. Uh, so I don't use that either. So we need a way to know if we are you know, close to the ground or touching the ground so that we can know when to jump. And the best way, way that I've found to do that is to just have an area defined under the player that detects if anything's inside of it. So for that, we're just going to be using an area 2D. This is a kind of physics body, but it doesn't interact with a physics system physically. Um, so in this area 2D, we've got a bunch of these um, familiar functions, and it needs a no. It needs a collision object, just like every other physics body. Let's give it a collision shape. 2D, and I like to have these be um, capsules, and you can just drag these however you want. So let's say what this is going to say is any ground that is in this little unoverlapped area right here we're going to know that we're on the ground. So now that we have this area um, and it's attached to our player, we want to be able to access this from our script. And the way that you would probably do something like this in Unity is to have a script attached to this area 2D that detects when um, you know, on rigid body 2D enter, um, override, and then it does something with the player's um, script. But there is a whole system in Godot dedicated to communicating with another object's functions from a script. And that is called the signal system. So signals are basically functions that will be called when a certain condition is met. So basically, if something happens somewhere, then a signal is going to be called, and you can do something, some behavior, when that function is called. So you can see all the signals attached to a specific node in its node properties uh, panel next to the inspector. So we can see that the area 2D has you know, area entered, exited, uh, shape entered, body entered. Um, and a bunch of other stuff that it inherits from Node. So we're going to be interested in this body entered and body exited. So with these signals, you can attach them to a different script and define the behavior that you want to run in that script instead of attaching a script to Area 2D itself. So we're going to be attaching body entered and body exited to our player script. So to do that, you just click on this body entered, click connect. It should automatically have player selected. And down here, it's going to basically specify the name of the function that you're making. So the default's usually fine. If you have a bunch of different um, signals that are all named the same thing, you may want to change this. But these defaults are just fine. And then you just hit connect. So now it's going to open up the script, and we see that we have a new function that is overwriting. And this is going to be called when a body enters our area 2D node. And we can do the same thing with body exited, player, connect it, and then we have area 2D body exited. And these look very similar to the um, override functions in Unity. We get a body that we can interact with. And yeah, so now that we have these two functions, we can basically know when there is some sort of body under the player. And that body is going to be the physics body or the static body of the um, tile sets that we have created. So there's a couple ways to do this. Um, you could set a Boolean to um, true whenever something exits and set it to false whenever something, ex well, no, the other way around.
around, enters and exits. Um, how I like to do this is I like to just have a counter. So just a, an integer um, number of objects. Area 2D. That's a very long winded variable name, but set that equal to zero, and then we're going to count up every time something enters the area 2D, and we're going to count down every time something exits. So, um, number of objects 2D plus equals one when body entered, and then the same thing. when the body exits, except that we want to subtract instead of add. So now we have this counter, and so our answer to the question of is there something, if is our feet touching the ground, is basically is this number greater than one? And we can create a function to check that. So func is on ground. Hard to see. And then eh. our answer is going to be return number of objects in area 2D is greater than zero. Eh. So that's going to be true whenever something's inside of it or multiple objects are inside of this area, and it's going to return false whenever that is not true. So we can use this in conjunction with our is action just pressed in that we can say if action is just pressed jump and is touching ground uh, this keyboard ground should be defined here oh no is on ground I named it is on ground, which is going to return true if there is you know that many objects, and we'll be able to jump. So if we go ahead and test that, then now there's something in that small little sliver of area under the player that allows us to jump, and we're still able to jump. obvious that I'm doing wrong before I did like this? Because I don't actually say anything. Um, Should you check if the body is actually the floor? If the player is stuck. That's true. Um, that is something that I forgot to do. So there is something always in contact with this area, and it's the player. <laughs> so. Now we can talk about groups, because groups are basically tags, and you can filter through objects that are interacting with each other by looking at their group. So the easy way to deal with this is to just say the player is a part of the group player. And so this is just going to basically a tag that you say, OK, this is a player. We can also say other things about the player, like um, is a body, is an NPC, or something, and then that'll define the behavior that things have with this player. And so in here, we can say that if player, well, if not player in body dot get groups do this function. So this is kind of a weird way of saying as long as the body isn't a player, do this thing. But the body is basically a list of strings, and you need to know that this isn't one of the strings contained in the groups attached to the player, if that makes any sense. So now that we are no longer touching the player, 
then we can no longer jump infinitely. Hooray! Yeah. That's not the only way to solve that issue. It's just the easiest to explain. Another way that we could have done it is we can interact with things called collision layers and collision masks. So what we could have done is we can specify that the player's collision is happening on a different layer than the area is checking. So if we wanted to um, move the player to this um, collider, we'd have to change things elsewhere in the program, which is why I didn't do this. But basically, if we have this checking in one layer, so this mask is what it's checking for, and this would be in, say, layer one, and then the player is in layer two, where it's not checking, the player in the area would never interact, and we wouldn't have to filter the um, functions like we did. But it's easier to just filter them, so that's what we did. Um, is there any other questions? We're basically right at the end. We're all good. What was the name of the function body.getGroups? Yeah, so um, yeah, so it's just body.get underscore groups. This body is basically going to be whatever physics body you're interacting with. And then get groups this gets you the list of groups that are in the body. Oh, that's what I was going to do. OK, um, one more quick thing. Um, this is a pixel art game, and everything seems really small. Like, we can barely even see the player there. So how do we make pixel big? Um, <laughs> pixel big by project settings window. So you can change the reference window size in Godot, and then scale it to something different later on. So the actual pixel width and height that Godot is going to use is defined by this uh, display window size width and height. So I'm going to set this to something like 200, no, 300, 180. <laughs> wow. Please don't be negative. 180, that would probably crash the game. Um, and then I'm going to see what that looks like. So that's a super tiny window. We can barely see anything. So you can implement a test width, uh, which is basically going to scale the game to whatever width or window size you want. So I'm going to do 1280 by 720. That's a good test width. You might want to make sure that whatever you're scaling with is a integer multiplication of this width and height. Otherwise, you're going to get inconsistent pixel sizes, um, and that doesn't look very good. The other thing that you need to change is this mode. Um, there are some interesting differences between 2D and viewport, um, and this aspect and shrink basically have to do with um, how your UI is going to scale and everything. Basically, we want to do 2D, and that's going to scale our game for us. So if we go ahead and play, then we can see we have a nice big window and nice big pixels. If we go up here, it actually starts to look like a video game. Hooray! Until we smash into a wall. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you all for attending. We will be doing more things in the next workshop. Yeah.